Well, first, um, uh, let me say that uh, while I'm the chair of this International Advisory Committee of the China International Development Research Network, the, the, <coughs> the, the chair and the founder of this network is Li Chaoyun, sitting right there, whom, from whom you will... He's the, he's the brains behind uh, the China International Development Research Network, and we are both on the, um, the Rising Powers uh, Development Program of the Institute of Development uh, Studies. And to do a little bit of advertising, we, next week there will be a paper that we've jointly written on the BRICS, understanding the BRICS. And uh, I think, uh, Andrew, your idea that uh, let's forget about um, the origin with Goldman Sachs because it was the BRICS summit meetings that are different, on a different track altogether, on a political track that uh, we really need to pay attention to. Uh, another bypass operation, by the way. <laughs> now, I have uh, done a very long uh, PowerPoint. It's going to take an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to uh, go um, uh, very fast. But uh, uh, I didn't have time to write a short one. Um, so uh, let me uh, just give you the headlines, because there is a storyline here. Uh, first of all, we are in a moment of uh, creative destruction in the established development finance industry. And then um, we have uh, development is now becoming defined as the transformation process. So transformation is a key word now in the SDGs and elsewhere. So development as transformation, and that requires what um, I've called um, with uh, Zhu Jia Jun, uh, public entrepreneurship. And uh, what that means is an active state. And that wasn't in the model that we've been working with for the last 20 years. The, the state, the role of the state being downplayed. We're now uh, in a world where we see the state is a vital, uh, proactive uh, part of the whole system. Then looking quickly at develop China's development finance, a new architect in the international development finance system. There's a whole new raft of Chinese-inspired or created institutions there. Then looking at the UN agreements on development and climate change, what are the financial frameworks there? And then looking at this whole question of transformational in potential and impact. That's what we're looking for in the system. We've, we've got huge transformations in climate and development ahead of us. That's what's in the SDGs, that's what's in the Paris Agreement. So um, global governance with a shared paradigm, that's the question. Can we have a, a, a global governance system with a shared paradigm? <coughs> so now, constructive, uh, creative destruction in the established development finance industry. What are the signs? There's a whole list of signs here. Um, the Development Assistance Committee, which invented the concept of official development assistance, has just revised it. They had to revise it. Why? Because there were a number of members who were giving loans raised from financial markets, passing them on to developing countries, no, no budget input, no fiscal input at all, and they counted as ODA. So sorry, this caused a big... Sorry, Professor, can you speak into the I have to speak in the mic first, sorry. <laughs> okay, so because of that, th that caused a great crisis. So ODA has been redefined so that that practice can't happen, but something else has been defined, something called total official sustainable... As, as, total official support for sustainable development to put all that kind of official lending into a new category outside of the ODA concept. But that's where all the money for all this infrastructure development, etc., and climate change is going to come, not from ODA, it's going to come from this other kind of official finance. So that uh, is a big discussion underway now. Should we have this new category and who's going to contribute to that? The scale of China's development lending is uh, huge. And just let me uh, tell you um, where, uh, some numbers that give an indication of this, although, Michael, you'll say some more about this, I hope. But uh, these are 2013 numbers. The development lending of the China Development Bank and Exim Bank, uh, the total development uh, portfolio was $282 billion. The World Bank Group was not much bigger at 332 billion. And uh, in 2013, uh, the China Development Bank and the Exim Bank, they put out $35 billion. The World Bank Group as a whole put out 
40 billion. Now that was 2013, 2013. Now China would be bigger than the World Bank group on many uh, estimations. China Development Bank has a loan book of 1.2 trillion dollars compared with the World Bank group's loan book of 332 trillion. Why is that? Because the China Development Bank has financed the whole urbanization process in China of 1.3 billion people with very fast growth. That's why it's uh, the institution it is today with the capacities it is today. It's why it's able to move into the international sphere with large amounts of money. So uh, that's China <coughs> impacting on the whole system. Then the new multilateral development banks. Again, China evolved in that whole story. And <coughs> they are causing reforms in existing uh, uh, MDBs. And <coughs> there are new bilateral development banks. Canada's just created one. Uh, in, Ch in France, the uh, uh, Agence Française de Developments combined with the Caisse de Depot, much bigger capital base, etc. Even in the United States, there are proposals for the US to have a development bank. So all this uh, story uh, is happening. We have the whole climate finance system, and we have South-South uh, funds, and we have the BRICS, of course. Now, uh, another sign is that in the Development Assistance Committee, the kind of global governance system for aid since 1960, a panel's just been launched to rethink the whole Development Assistance Committee and to rethink what kind of membership it should have, what should be its scope, and it's to report by the end of this year. And then we have export credit disciplines, which have been uh, run as a, a gentleman's agreement, but centered in the OECD. Now the US made an agreement with China because they want China to come in to start another process on export credits. So it's called the International Working Group and attempt to bring China into the export credit uh, discipline. So there's two export credit processes going along right now. And then finally, debt sustainability frameworks and development finance assessments. How do you make the move from talking about billions to talking about trillions, as we all say? What does that mean for debt sustainability frameworks? What does it mean for looking at the development finance agendas of individual countries? So that's why we have this, uh, this period of creative destruction. Now, uh, the renaissance of public entrepreneurship and economic transformation. Transforming our world is the title of the UN agreement on the SDGs. <coughs> What happened when we moved from MDGs to SDGs? MDGs, eight goals, poverty, education, health, etc., etc. Very discrete goals. What happened with the SDGs? They're now 17, but the way to think of it is that all of the social and economic processes of development, which were left out of the MDGs, they were somewhere implicit in the background, have been brought into the framework. That's why there are 17 goals. There's urbanization, there's technology, there's trade. They're all in there. So it's a different animal from the MDGs. <coughs> so the, uh, <coughs> the development process implicit in the SDGs requires an active state. It requires public entrepreneurship. It, re it means going beyond the World Bank's doing business concept of getting the business environment right to an active state that's going in creating the infrastructure, <coughs> creating <coughs> the, all of the things that in OECD countries governments do to help their private sectors exist and to work. And there's a big debate going on, on a big intellectual fight uh, going on, on that question right now. So public entrepreneurship is the public action needed to create dynamic economies. And we have totally underestimated that in the development debate. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, the economy in developed and developing countries is a co-creation, a co-creation of public and private entrepreneurship. And so that means we have to adjust away from neoliberalism, if you like, to 
as a, a, a state which is a fundamental part of the process. And of course, in China, that was uh, very much the case. Uh, and it's the reality, as I say, in OECD countries today, if you really look at what states and cities are doing in terms of uh, building that thing. The resurrection of Alexander Hamilton. He's now a musical on Broadway, <laughs> but uh, people are now saying Alexander Hamilton, 1792, wrote a report to US Congress on the role of the state in helping manufacturing industry. People are starting to refer back to that now. Now, China's development finance. So we've got what I call a flotilla of new multilateral development banks, the AIIB, the NDB, there's the, going to be a Shanghai Cooperation Organization Bank, there's the Silk Road Fund. But there's new South-South funds, which China has created for the SDGs, $2 billion for climate change, $3 billion. Created new intellectual centers, for uh, one for international development knowledge, uh, one for new structural economics, Justin Lin, and um, another one at Peking University for an academy for South-South learning. And uh, China has brought in this new language into the development dis discourse, transformation. It came out of the G20 high-level group on infrastructure, where China argued that you have to take account of the transformative impact of infrastructure. Otherwise, you underestimate the, the uh, outcomes of, internet, of, uh, of this investment. The regional initiatives that China has, uh, Silk Roads, Johannesburg Action Plan, Latin America, Middle East, Asia, wherever you go, China has a regional action plan. So um, let's go uh, very quickly now. The Addis Ababa action um, agenda has a financial framework. That is that each country should have a, uh, an integrated national financing framework. We're going beyond ODA, ODA is still there, but there's all this other finance and countries have to have a strategy for raising and using that finance. And then there's the green finance. The Paris Agreement has a, yet another financial system which is responsible not to the UN, but to the UNFCC and Bonn. So uh, just uh, to very quickly uh, finish, uh, this shared paradigm is emerging, I think, built around transformation, built around connectivity, um, we're in a world where the G20 is very important. Why? Because it can connect up all these things. The value added of the G20 is its convening power. It can convene across ministries. And it can convene across international organizations. No other, no other part of the system can do that. And that, I think, is really uh, why the G20 can be important in this. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>